So reading from Luke chapter 2, from verse 25 to 35. Thank you. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be, oppo- and a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jill. If if you've got a Bible and you want to follow it, it's on page 63 of the New Testament. It's a story, as you'll have gathered from very early on in Jesus' life, where he is taken by his parents um, to the temple. And um, that amazing prayer is prayed over him. Let's um, pray ourselves now for a moment. Lord, as we hear that story of Jesus as a little baby, as we hear the story of what you're doing in people's lives, like Ruth, who we've just been praying for, we reflect on our own lives, from cradle to grave. And we thank you for this day. We ask that you would help us, help me as I speak, help us as we think about you and your love for us, to make sense of our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of days ago, I was writing my Mother's Day card to uh, my mum, who lives in Devon. And um, I don't mind admitting, I got a bit emotional. I started to think about my life from the very first days. And I started to think about all that I have and all, all that I am, that I only have and that I only am, because of what my parents, in particular my mum, have done for me. And I don't think, well, I know there's no one in my life who has been there for me like my mum across the whole of my life. She's just been there. And um, it made me very emotional when I thought about that. And I know today, Mother's Day, is an emotional day for lots of people for all kinds of reasons. And when I think about all the tears and all the joyful times and also just the humdrum normal normal days... Um, that parents are there for their children, it, may, it makes me think about God's presence with us. And I think we see that in, um, in this story. God is always there for us. And um, I saw this quote, which I think you'll like this week. Can I have the next one, Gareth? If you fall, I will be there. Floor. <laughs> Did you like that? I saw that quote, I thought, oh, is that a quote from the Bible? And then I clicked on it, and it was attributed to the floor. And I thought, well, there there is a certain inevitability about that, isn't there? People say, you know, there's the only thing certain in life is death and taxes. But actually, it's also certain that if you fall over, the floor will get you in the end. And um, I just thought about the inevitability of that. That's just a given, isn't it? And we all live our lives knowing that that's always true, that if we fall over, we're going to hit the floor. Some of you can talk to me later about water and walking on water or anything like that. But basically, if we fall fall down, we're going to hit floor. And it made me think about um, parents and about God and about the things that we think are just always there. I think the fact that our parents are always there for us is, is why their loss when we lose them is a pain that is so deeply felt. Someone once said to me, after losing... Um, one of his parents, it's as if someone has moved a mountain range. There's this, been this backdrop to my life that has just always been there. Every time I've looked up, there, there they are. And then one day they're gone. 
It's like looking up and seeing a whole range of mountains that's suddenly not there anymore. And I think that's the kind of dependability that anchors our lives. Mary was that person for Jesus. And she carries him in to the temple and they have this encounter with Simeon that we've just heard about. And I, I imagine, because this is what babies are like, that Jesus was sleeping for some of that. He might have been crying at the top of his lungs, it's not recorded, but I'm sure at some point in that temple experience, he was completely unaware of anything that was going on. And Mary was just holding him in her arms. Maybe she was singing. Maybe she just gazed down at him. We all sleep as well. That's the third thing. It's not, or fourth thing. It's not just death and taxes. It's not just that we land on the floor when we fall over. We all sleep. I'm sure you've never thought about that, but because I have so many hours in the week that I don't know what to do with, I've been thinking about it this week. And I've been thinking, we all sleep. Every person who's ever lived sleeps. The only person who never sleeps is God. In the Bible it says, the God of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. He's always watching over us. And sleep, the fact that we need to sleep, marks us out as being different from God. You know, God is the only one who never gets tired. God is the only one who is always on. And we, if we're not careful, we try to pretend we're like God. We're invincible. We can always be switched on. But actually, sleep is an expression of the fact that we're different from God. I love this um, next verse. In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, will keep me safe. That's Psalm 4, verse 8. The sleep is not only universal, it's healthy. You know, if people can't sleep for long enough, they end up going to see their doctor. It's restorative. Isn't it wonderful, that feeling when you've just had a really long sleep and you wake up? It's a time when we're very vulnerable, like this little one here. You know, if you're an enemy soldier and you're parachuted in behind enemy lines, the one thing you wouldn't do is fall asleep, at least not until you know that you're safe and someone's watching over you. When we sleep, we make ourselves vulnerable. Sleep is an expression of dependence on someone else, of trust that we're going to be safe. I wonder, I've been thinking, why, why is it that children are fight against their bedtime so much? Why is it that the one battle you know, that every child has with their parents is, I don't want to go to sleep yet? Is it because they're growing up and they don't want to be dependent? They don't want to do what they're told? When we sleep, it's an expression of trust. And when we realise that God is the one who is always there for us, our mountain range then sleep can become for us an expression like this. I will lie down and sleep in peace because I know who's keeping me safe. I don't mind admitting that. This, this is something I find hard. I find I struggle to go to bed on time. I think my life will be much better if I watch one more of the matches on Match of the Day before turning the TV off and going to bed. Or if I get a, a few more things done before I go to sleep, life will somehow be better. And I wonder inside, am I actually rebelling against the fact that actually God's got me? He can look after me. I wonder, have you ever thought about your own relationship with sleep? See, God can work while we're sleeping. It makes me laugh that this talk, I'd actually prepared a different talk, but I wasn't very happy with it. And I went to, I went to bed um, praying, God, please help me with this talk. And when I woke up, I just knew what I was going to talk about in this talk. And um, I thought, how did that happen? Well, maybe while I was asleep, God was still working. Maybe God was still active. And all the way through the Bible, we see people who God guides while they're asleep, through their dreams, or in other ways. Every day starts, actually, the night before. If you're Jewish... Literally, you count the day from sunset, from the evening before. And um, you only need to ask someone who hasn't had a good night's sleep to know how much the next day is affected by sleep. 
Sleep deprivation is used as a form of torture, isn't it? So I just want to encourage us that God is always there looking over us and that we can sleep without fear, without worry. And so my homework to set you this week is go and sleep. Get to bed on time. Think about, even pray about, the relationship of sleep to your own spiritual life. God is there when we sleep. God is also there for us when we sin. And this is something that, of course, Mary never dealt with because Jesus was without sin, like us in every way apart from our sin. But Jesus was born into Israel, as Simeon explained in those verses. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. See, Jesus was born at a time where people thought God had forgotten about Israel. 500 years had passed and no prophets had appeared. And suddenly this baby is born and God's rescue arrives. Because God was there all the time, even though the people of Israel were going, where are you, God? And they turned their backs on him, what the Bible calls sin. There was Jesus. When we think he's gone, when we think he's given up on us, he's right there. One parenting experience that I um, endure from time to time is when my children are very naughty, I shut them in their room. And they cry. And they don't like it. And they get very angry, especially with me. Now they probably think that I've shut them in their room and gone downstairs, I'm having a good time in the lounge. But I'm not. I'm standing on the other side of the door, waiting. Waiting for the moment when they can put their anger aside. When they can calm down. When they can open the door from the inside and say, I'm sorry. And then things are as they should be. Now, am I the only one for whom that describes their relationship with God? Yeah, sometimes something happens and I shut myself away. I don't think God shuts me away. There's a difference there. But I get so angry, especially with God sometimes. And sometimes it takes me a very long time to come out of my room to say I'm sorry. But when we sin, God is not far away. You look at this next picture, this famous painting. This is the prodigal son returning to the father who's been waiting for him for years. And the moment the son came back and appeared far off on the road leading up to the house, the father was there and he ran to meet him. So great is his desire to be reconciled with his son. And Jesus told this as a picture for us. That when we sin, when we turn our backs on God, when we rebel, when we kick and scream, when we get angry with God, God is just there on the other side of the door waiting for us to come back. God's there when we sleep. He's there when we sin. He's there for us when we suffer. Mary was told when Jesus was a tiny baby, perhaps sleeping in her arms, a sword will pierce your own soul too. And most people agree that that's a reference to the end of Jesus' life, on the last day, when he's hanging on the cross, and his own mother is standing there watching her son, who's been beaten, who's been through a sham of a trial, who's against all justice, completely unfairly condemned to death though he'd done nothing wrong and he hangs there and dies before her eyes I mean surely a sword did pierce her soul with grief and she heard Jesus himself say my God, my God why have you forsaken me now, can you imagine hearing those words and yet even in that moment of suffering that had been predicted years, 30 years before in Mary's life, where Jesus' life comes to an end, God is accomplishing the rescue, the salvation of the whole world. In this moment of suffering and tragedy, God is reconciling to himself the whole of the world that he's made. Through Jesus' death, Everything is forgiven. 
everyone gets a new start. And so this moment of profound suffering and pain actually becomes a moment of victory and joy. But Mary doesn't know that until three days later on Easter Day, when Jesus rises from the dead. And so God is there in our suffering, but we can't feel him there. And even Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? But he's there as we suffer. We can only see it later. There are a few people who, can, who endure suffering with a, a wonderful and precious sense of God being with them. But I think most of us, when we suffer, we're confused. We think, what's going on here? I don't understand. But if we will wait, then we see that God was there all along. And ultimately, this happens with our own death. You know, one day, sooner or later, every single one of us will be suffering at the moment of death And we will have to trust that, although we may not know it in this moment, that if we wait, we will see God. That if we fall asleep in peace, we will meet the one who alone makes us sleep in safety. God is always with us. And although these are sobering things to think about, matters of life and death, It's actually a really joyful message that we have someone who forms the backdrop of our life, the mountain range, who's there cradling us day after day, who's watching us day and night, who's always looking at us with eyes of love, who follows every moment of our lives and from whom we can never, ever be separated, even by death itself. The Bible says, even when your mother and father forsake you, I will never abandon you. Those are the words that God speaks to us. He's always here for us, watching over us, singing. As you go to sleep tonight, God is watching you. When you're standing on the other side of the door, feeling far from God, he's there for you. When you suffer, when it feels like it's never going to end, God is there. Hang on and you will see him. We're going to take a few moments to pray now together. And I want to invite you, maybe one of those three things, sleeping or sinning or suffering, maybe it's something else, some place where you long to know God near to you. I'm going to pray for us and invite you in the silence to pray to God yourself, saying, please, let me know you near to me today. Let's take a moment of silence and bow our heads and pray. Last Saturday, about 40 of us went to Flackwell Heath for the day and spent the day uh, thinking and praying and learning about God's Holy Spirit, his presence who draws near to us. And we read these verses from later um, in Luke's Gospel that we've been looking at this morning. Ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Father, we pray that you would give your Holy Spirit to us here, now, to know your loving presence with us. Strengthen our faith that you are watching over us, that you are with us in our sleep, that you're waiting to forgive us for our sin. 
that you stand with us in our suffering. And if you are here this morning thinking, I've, I've never entered into this at all, well, you can right now. And you can ask God to come and be there as a loving parent to catch you when you fall. Father, I pray for anyone who has just said that in their hearts, that they want you to be the one who catches them when they fall. That they want you to be there for them every day of their life. That they want to come out from behind the door and ask forgiveness and a new start. I pray that now you would pour out your spirit upon them. Fill them with your love, your very presence. And let them know that they are your children, that they belong to you. There may be others who you're thinking of, who you know need to know God's presence. Maybe they're people you know, maybe people or situation that you've seen on the news. But just take a moment to lift them before God and pray that he would be there for them. Every week before the service starts, we pray that God would show us um, things that he wants us um, to pray for. And um, this week, again, some, we, we give these out, I give these words out week by week, and, um, and I think it's fair to say that every week someone responds to at least one of them. Um, so I encourage you to, um, if these describe you, to come and ask one of the prayer team to pray for you. This is something we said last week. We felt um, that there was someone with a painful knee and that you heard this read out last week and didn't respond, but that God uh, wants to, to bless you and to heal the pain in that knee. We think there's someone else here who's suffering with toothache, someone who's been diagnosed with a kidney stone, and someone else whose heart is just longing for love, that you know you're here this morning and you are aching to know the love that you know you're missing. If those words describe you, or if you'd like prayer for any other thing, then please do come forward and ask uh, for me or for uh, one of the prayer team. We would love to pray for you. Father, we give you thanks for your presence with us this morning. And we ask that as we um, remember and honour our mothers, Lord, so we would know your love for us, which is there every day of our lives. We pray for those who are raising children, that you would strengthen them and give them the patience and the energy and the love that they need. And we ask for your blessing on this church family, old and young, in all our diversity. We pray that we would know your presence with us and that overflowing with your love, we might be like you to all the people we meet this week. In Jesus' name, amen.